Hi everyone, Marshall here. Thought I'd check in on y'all tonight. See what's going on with everybody. Tuesday night comes around quick. <clears throat> a lot of times it'll feel like you just did a video a day or two ago. And then boom, it's time for another one. Hope everybody's doing okay. Me, uh, and the weather is, let me bring this forward some, there we go. Me, this weather's been crazy. Oh. Wait and see if we get some people in here, who all we get in here. See where the conversation goes tonight. Is it going to be more about RC? Is it going to be more about fishing, lures, baits, you know, rod and reels, kayaks? Is it going to be mainly RC? Or is it going to be somebody popping in here talking about a new video game they just got for the PlayStation 4 or something? That's why it's called hobby talk. Because we don't just talk about one hobby. People bring it up and I discuss it with them. If I know something about it, if I don't, I try to put them in touch with somebody that does. But got started at about 8, probably 8.26. What's up, Bull Gear RC videos? Doing good? I take it you've been busy and you had a chance to get that uh, Ram Power Wagon out yet. Or it didn't come through to my notifications that you uploaded a video of it yet. So I figure you ain't got around to that one yet. Ah, working on the CR24. I've been waiting to see that Ram Power Wagon. That's what I was waiting to see. Because a couple buddy of mine, they uh, they said once they saw one run, and not just by the company. They uh, they might go with that instead of getting a twenty four scale. You know, they hadn't decided yet. What's up, Pevy Putt guy? Hi, I just had a severe injury. What happened to you? <clears throat> oh, Bull Gear RC videos. I did see the SEX24 you were talking about. Ooh, I know that feeling. I, I, I messed up my left hamstring before. I pulled the groin a, quite a few times, and I've got a hernia down in that region. In the groin area, so yeah, I have to be real careful in that area. But yeah, it's a major pain anytime you mess with anything down there. But Bull Gear RC videos. Uh, I did see the SCX24 with the Chevrolet body. You know what C10 that you were telling me about? I think you said it was a 67 Chevy C10 body that comes on it. It's got the, I'll try to do a run video. I was in Michigan, so I was visiting family. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, like I said, uh, the only reason they're, at, they're just asking me because I had told them, one of my YouTube buddies had told me he got one of those, and they wanted to know what somebody thought of it. And all I could tell them was what I'd seen on the videos that mainly are put out by Panda Hobby. You know, they look like they're pretty good rigs, but 
They look like they might even be better than the Hobby Plus 118th scale. But I didn't want to say straight up, hey, you should go get this Dodge Ram Power Wagon, you know, from them and pass up the Hobby Plus one, which has got that the Chevy body, the Toyota 4Runner, and the one that looks kind of like a, either a Bronco or an International Scout. I didn't want to steer somebody in the wrong direction until I knew a little bit more about the the power wagon one. Cool. I'm sorry you're going to be on crutches for six weeks. That's got to suck. You know, I've been on crutches before. I definitely know the feeling. I tore this shoulder out, <clears throat> had to have surgery on it, and I had to try to put the car in gear with the left arm just so I could drive a little bit. And it and when you got when I had straight drives, I couldn't even do it. I just had to stay at home. Yeah, I agree with you there. From what I've seen, and from when people open the tops of them and show all the parts to them. Everything seems like it's better quality than the Hobby Plus 18th scale, especially the shocks. Because like yours, yours has the plastic body shocks on it. Whereas the Jeep, yours was like one, one oh nine ninety nine, I believe, your power wagon. Now the Jeep one is one twenty nine ninety nine, and they put partial aluminum shocks on it. But I think they give a bigger reel for that one than what they give for the one that you've got. And they give like aluminum shocks. Also has a bigger motor. Oh, well, see, yeah, that's, that's a given. They definitely got a bigger motor than the, than the hobby plus. But from what I've seen people running the hobby plus the 18th scale seem to really do well with what they've got. I'm not saying they're going to beat the Panda Hobby, but they do good, you know. But if you're going to pay $129.99 for the Hobby Plus, and unless you're going out to the body, me, I would go over here and either get the Jeep for $129.99 or get one of their other ones like what you got, the Power Wagon, and either get the $129.99 version or just get the 109 109.99. You know, because you got the green and black that you got, and they've got a maroon and black in that on the power wagon. And a lot of people like the maroon and black. So, unless you're just really wanting that body that's on the 18th scale. Yeah, that's what I had heard. And I heard it was a a real good radio considering what you paid for. But yeah, I'm torn. I'm torn between getting one of the Panda Hobby 118th scales or getting that SEX 24 Chevrolet C10 67. That 1967 Chevy C10 from Axial. That SEX 24. I'm torn between those two. Because I don't have any 118th scale trail trucks or crawlers. None of the 118th scale. But I've got the HBX Devastator four-wheel steering crawler. And I've got the ECX little mini barrage 24th scale little trail truck crawler. So see, if I went with another 24th scale, then I got three of those to kind of run on. Like if I wanted to run them all against each other or run them all on the same day. You could do up a little course and mess around with all of them. So I'm torn between the SCX-10, well, the SCX-24, with that Chevy, that Chevy truck body, and then the Panda Hobbies, 118. I may pick up a barrage. Now, if you pick up an ECX, the little mini barrage, two things I would advise. I would advise, just from 
One of them's from personal experience. Go online and get you one of those little HG micro servos that cost about seven dollars from China with the metal gear. It's got metal gears in it. A hundred percent better than what they put in it stock because mine burned up after the first run. It went wacko on the beginning of the second run. I was out on my second run going up a hill. And it got while I was having to turn the steering two to three times to get the wheels to start responding. As soon as I put a new servo on it, they were like this. So if it was me, I would replace the servo right off the bat. Just put a little seven dollar micro servo, like one of those little H. I think it's MG. It's not HG. It's MG. One of those MG ones that you can get off like Banggood, Gearbest, Over China ones. Uh, the I think they're blue. And if I was you, just throwing my opinion out there, I would look to upgrade the battery system. Because to me, they don't give it enough runtime for what they charge on that one. If you're talking about the little barrage, it looks like a honcho. Now, I don't know if they updated it when they did the one with the Jeep looking body. I have two more power mods I want to do. Cool. Cool. Man, I'm going to tell you, I got to get online because you can't buy anything for ECX products now except basically on Horizon Hobby or in the store at Horizon Hobby. And I either my either my uh, battery charger that plugs into the laptop, you know, the USB one that came with it, or either my battery's dead. The charger or the battery's bad. One of the two because I, don't, I can charge it what I think is full charge running out in the front yard for maybe two minutes and it's dead. That's all I get out of it. Two minutes. Two and a half at the max. And that's if I'm feathering, like slow down, start to climb something, pause for a little bit, and then come up it. And it's just, you should at least get five to eight to ten minutes out of that thing. You know. But uh, I'm not sure if it's the battery. just doesn't want to hold the complete charge. Or if it was the charger that came with it. Doesn't want to charge it right. Some people said they got defective chargers. I heard others say they got defective batteries from that from the batches of the more small 124 scale. But since I've already got mine, I just want to order another little battery charger and another battery. And I'm gonna mark like the battery, the new battery and charger like A, mark the old battery and charger B, and that way I know which one is acting right. I want to build a servo transmission and do the to me a mini gearbox mod. Cool. Part of part of me says just get the SEX 24 1967 Chevy C10. Get that. Get my barrage, another battery, and a charger, and that way I've got the barrage, the axial SEX 24. And I would have my HPX Devastator with the four-wheel steer. And I could run a couple of them together or run all three of them. Excuse me, if I wanted to. But part of me says just come away from the 24th scale and jump up to that 18th scale in the middle and get one of those Panda Hobbies. But now, for some reason or another, might just be me, for some reason or another, I love the Hobby Plus, the one that looks like the International Scout or the Bronco, the charcoal gray with, what is it, the black stripes. I just love the look of that body. Put Devastator running gears in your barrage. Yeah, it's possible, but with that ECX barrage battery, unless you up, unless you fix that electronic issue right now, there ain't no sense in doing any upgrades to it until I get the battery situation straightened out because two minutes ain't worth doing a bunch of mods to the electronics you know, as far as motor and transmission and gears. You know, I mean, it won't run, but two minutes. I took it out in the yard once the 
when I moved up here, was testing out the new servo and everything. And I might have got two, two and a half minutes, if that. But I know if I get the SCX24, no matter which one of it, one of them I get, whether it was the Deadbolt, whether it was the Jeep, or whether it was the Chevy C10, I know I'm going to get a good product because, you know, I haven't heard anybody really complaining about the SCX24s. I mean, I heard a few people complain about it, the Deadbolt one, because, you know, the cage makes it tip over. Oh, you seen a guy do it to a CR24 and it was mean. Wishing I was fishing 73. Hey, brother. Good to have you in here. Like I said, right now, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. I kind of want to jump into that 18th scale because they, they still crawl pretty well, I think, outside or trail pretty well outside where your littlest ones, unless you do a lot of mods to them, they're more light trail to inside, most of them. Most of them, especially the cheaper ones. But that 118th scale hobby, pan, Panda Hobby, it's just, it's a true. Get me. Get me, man. Get me. Get me. And the axle saying, no, no, this way. <laughs> you know? But I know the main thing I got to do is I got to find me a camera that the battery doesn't go dead in 15, 20 minutes. Like the one I've got. That Hawk, that Firefly 6S Plus. SCX24 is the best of the batch, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. The Coyote, the Coyote Subaru Brat and Pup. The pumpkins are too big. <clears throat> and the tires are too small with them big, fat pumpkins. Now, if it had the SCX24 wheels under the Coyote Pup, and maybe you lifted the body up a little bit, it might be a little better. But I still don't think it's going to be better than the SCX24. The Barrage, it's probably right along there with the Outback version 1, the RGT version 1, some of those. But, you know, they come out with that with the RGT version 2 that has the motor in the front and has the servo up on the chassis. It's a uh, Land Rover Defender. You got a burgundy wine colored body and I think a dark gray one. They say that one's right up there because of all that forward weight bias of having your motor at the very front of the car and having your survey right up there on the chassis as well. They say that one's really good. And I think that one's about, I want to say about 90 bucks, 80, 90 bucks, somewhere along there. Well, wishing I was. Hello, you should. Kyosho. I've seen a few Kyoshos I would like to own. I've seen a few I would like to own. A couple of them I wouldn't get near because. You know, the name's Budget Guy. Can't touch too many of the Keo shows. Oh, you decided to go away from the bug body? Didn't you have a little bug body on your CR24? Vintage Tamiya's. Yeah, I've got a couple to me as they're not vintage. They're like the re-release that they did in like the 90s or first part of the 2000s, something like that. And I've got the uh, Tamiya Sand Rover and I've got a, a Tamiya, T I think it's a TL-01, if I'm not mistaken. I got the TL-01, which is four-wheel drive, and then I had the 
to me a Sand Rover, which is two wheel drive, the bug Doom buggy. So you ordered one? I was I was this close. Where did you find it to order, man? I haven't seen one on any of the sites I've been on. Bull Gear RC videos. Where did you find one to order it? I went online looking for them. And everywhere I looked, all the, you know, like Horizon Hobby, A-Main, and places like that. RPP. Oh. Let me guess. You got the uh, the red, the maroon, and, and gray Toyota 4Runner. I had a TL01, and don't forget that there's a remake of the, to me, the Scorcher. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think you would. Yeah, they got some nice Tamiyas. Yeah, I didn't think you would go with the uh, Suzuki Jimny. Yeah, the Tamiya Terra Scorcher. That's a cool looking rig. Oh, I've also got a couple of CCO1s. So I've actually got four Tamiya RCs. Like I said, the, the Sand Rover, two-wheel drive, the TL01, four-wheel drive, and then the two CCO ones. One's the Unimog, the older model Unimog with the round lights. And the second one, I've got a generic new bright Jeep body on it. Yeah, Sand Scorcher. They are sick looking. I love that sand scorcher. I saw somebody take a sand scorcher and put a, a, a CMX, the MST CMX chassis. They put the sand scorcher body down on it. Then they found a small roof rack, only about like that. And they set that and it, they bent it and they made that fit up on the roof, made it look like it was made for it. This thing looked really cool. So a, tra a sand scorcher trail truck, you know, because they had to see a mix chassis up under it. Yeah, that's what Bull Gear RC videos and me were just discussing when you were typing the other stuff. He ordered the Toyota 4Runner. The burgundy or wine and black one. And then I got they got kind of the gunmetal gray and black one. And then they've got the two Suzuki Jimny ones. I don't know, man. I've heard some bad things about that CCO too. That you gotta do way too many upgrades just to make it worth the crap. And if I've got to upgrade something as much as you people are saying you got to do to it, you might as well go with the cheaper CCO one and just do the upgrades to it. I mean, because the worst thing everybody talks about the CCO one is you got to put a high turn motor in it, like a 55 turn up to an 80 turn because the way it's geared, and you got to work on the steering because it's got all that steering slot. That's the worst two things about the CCO one. The CCO two. I don't like the linkages, the way they designed that, or none of that. I mean, I like that they took a step up and tried to do something, but to me, just my opinion, you might as well get the CMX, you know, like the MST CMX chassis. I mean, it's basically the same thing as the CCO2. They're almost identical when you put them beside each other, you know. So I don't know if I would go for a CCO2, my opinion. Are you talking about the Beetle one with all the metal parts and the live axle in the rear? I don't know. I saw it on uh, one of those, like, Korean, like, RC channels, and they had, like, 12 trucks out running them, and one of them was a bug, and I recognized the wheels and tires from the from the first CMX RC that came out. I recognize that chassis system. Uh, I recognize them wheels and tires that were sitting up under it. 
and it was a scorcher. Had the little driver hooked up in there, and then they had a little bent roof rack sitting up on it. Spare tire mounted right above where the motor sticks out, right there at the back windshield. And then they had it lit up, and they had Baja-like lights on it and everything. It was cool. Yeah, Mateo did a comparison, and he said, yes, yeah, some of the things were better, some of them wasn't. He said, the tires are definitely softer than the CCO1s, which is definitely true. But he even said he didn't like the way the links and everything were set up, the lower links. He said he found them to make you bind up every time you tried to go over rocks with it. But, I mean, if I got to do $200 in upgrades to fix that CCO1 or CCO2 chassis, I just stick with the CCO1 and put the $200 in it. And make it good. I mean, I ain't planning on taking either one of them into a competition. <laughs> you know, if I want to go into a competition, I would either go with the Red Cat, an Axial, a Traxxas, you know, somebody like that, you know. But yeah, I do like the CCO too, as far as they tried to make an effort. But to me, they could have done a little bit better than what they did. For as long as they've been doing stuff. Because think about it. They should know all about crawling and everything. They had the Tamiya CR01, which is nothing but a big crawler. I was hoping the CCO2 would be at least as good as the CMX or better. Yeah, at least. But I find them to be right there together. Has a locked two-wheel drive transmission. Ah. I found an original sand scorcher in mint condition for 200 on Craigslist. And... Oh, man. Yeah, it's hard to find one in mint condition. Well, being, being budget guy, <laughs> about the most I would be able to do would be able to buy, you know, like the basic chassis system for SEX2 or a copy of that. Start out there, put my electronics in it, put the right wheels on it for whatever class I was going to be in and put me a body on it and the radio and everything. You know, test it out a little bit or whatever or go ahead and paint it and then test it out and try it out, you know, and see what I could do. Now, if I went with class one, of course, you got to make sure you got real smaller tires. You know, what is it, 105 or 106 millimeter is as tall as they can be. The one point, the four, you know, the 1.9s, I think all, the tall as they can be is 106 millimeter for class one. Oh, I don't doubt that there'll be good parts for it. But my point is, if somebody's on a budget and you got to spend $270 to buy, say, said CCO2, you build it, you get it all the way built, then out comes all these aluminum upgrades and everything to make it as good as an SCX-10-2, a Red Cat, Gen-8, Traxxas, TRX-4 Sport, and ones like that, even some of the RGTs, you got to dump another $200 or more into it just to get it to reach generally what an Axial SEX-10-2 can do pretty much stop. Unless you're just going to run it in the woods on some basic flat trails just for looks. I just, I love my CCO one chassis i love my cco1s i've had my unimog going on five years that unimog is not going anywhere it will be mine until it you know just falls apart and i can't put it back together but i'm not going to go dump 
the Tamiya all metal parts into it just to try to make it perform a little bit. If it's going to cost me more than what I can go buy an axial chassis system and build one for. Do you know the Sand Scorcher did have a re-release? Yeah. That's probably the one. If I was ever going to get me a Sand Scorcher, I would probably have to go with a re-release kit and then just build it, you know. Like I said, don't get me wrong. I like Tamiya. I like how tough and durable they can be. Even though they're put together with Phillips head screws, I've seen guys bash these things to know like nobody's business. And they just give them throttle and they continue to go. So yeah, I don't doubt that they're you know they're de dependable as far as reliable stuff like that. But it's just, you know, when it comes to the crawler game and to the scene, if you go up in the woods and you're doing a G6 or you're doing an actual Sorka event, Class 1 or Class 2, you don't see too many CCO1s, and I don't think you would see too many CCO2s. I don't even think you would see that many on a, a Sorka event. I don't think you'd see that many CMX chassis up there. Now, you might on a couple of G6 events. Because I've seen people run a little bit of everything up on them. Yeah, that's what the Sand Rover had. I think it's a DT. I think it's got the DT chassis under the Sand Rover. I think I only paid, it was $100 for my Sand Rover. And then I bought the, you know, what I needed. I bought a radio and receiver. And I had a set of tires and wheels from another buggy that had burned up. The whole thing just got destroyed. And I kept the tires and wheels off of it. And when I got the Sand Rover, I didn't like the wheels and tires that came with it because the Tamiya tires were too hard. So I took the wheels and tires off of this other buggy, slapped them on there. I'm looking real hard at the Shepra from Team Garage Hack. Ah! Excuse me. Well, you know, considering it's a cheaper RC, the newer RGTs have made a lot of noise lately. One of the newest ones, I think it's the one that looks like the Toyota Helix. They call it the Pioneer. It has the motor forward, servo on the chassis, and I think it has uh, the divorce transfer case in the middle. I could be wrong, but I think that's what it has too. I think it's got all that. And that thing's only like 260, 267 on eBay. Brand new. Yeah, you're probably going to have to put a better servo in it. You're probably going to have to change out the wheels and tires or something with better grip. But how many people don't change stock servos and don't change RTR tires? Most people do. But as far as the rest of the stuff, seems pretty good. You know, there was an independent front suspension. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, about three or four. About three or four people that I watched on YouTube were changing theirs out to that new setup. And the other 10 or 20 that had it, they liked what they had, and they were just sticking with it. I think they were going to go in and uh, put the higher overdrive gear and see how how much more power the front end would have pulling it up with the gear ratio changed even more and just leave the solid axle on front. That's about what the Shepra kit costs. Yeah, but the only thing about a kit is if you're on a budget and you want something that you can just get out, go home, open the box, take it out, charge up batteries, go out on the trail and at least have a little fun with it and then go, okay, those tires don't grip well. Let me get some more. Let me get some better tires. Or that steering's a little sloppy or slow. Let me get a better servo. At least you're messing with it time you get it for under 300. 
for around 267 with a kit if you pay two to 250 to 300 for a kit you still got to build it you still got to buy all the stuff to go to it if you don't have it and if you're on a budget most people don't have all the extra stuff laying around but i'd like to know where you got the shepherd kit from because i'd like to at least take a look at it i've never seen one what's up massive clouds I've never seen a shepherd kit before. So was that RPP or is that somewhere else? Bull gear RC videos. Team garage hack. <clears throat> I may I may have to give it a look. You know. Well, that's just like that RGT that's got all the aluminum everywhere. And got carbon fiber stuff on it. The Jeep pickup looking one. And they want $280 for it on Banggood. And it doesn't come with any electronics. And a lot of people's like, well, why is it so expensive? Well, it's because of the way it's made. It's supposed to be very durable. But you still got to add everything to it. And a lot of people say, well, why would I pay $280 for that? And I can just go get... You know, the Gen 8 for three, ready to run Gen 8 for 300, you know. A lot of people are like, you know, we'll just get that. Ain't but $20 difference. If a kit's going to be 280 why not just spend the 300 and get the, the Gen 8? Once you put a battery in it, you're having fun. But I'm going to have to go take a look at the Shepra kit. Master Cloud said he'd really like to see a one-tenth scale shirt. Yeah, it's like certain certain products. It's really hard to get here that they sell in other countries. Like if you want an FTX brand, if you want something from F FTX, it's hard to get the majority of like any other RTRs from FTX. The majority of them, uh, you generally can't find them in the states on too many sites for sale. You very rarely see one. It is full-on competition kit. Holmes Hobby, comp frame rails, forward motor mount. Similar to Toyzuki. Ah. There was one. I forgot what it was. It came out, and I, I was really interested in it. I really wanted the RC. And I'm seeing it on different you know channels and everything and watching it. And it looked like it was a knockoff Jeep. It was a knockoff Jeep. Had roof rack lights here. Had lights in the front bumper, lights in the rear bumper. So it came with all those lights. Had the little plastic driver interior with a driver figure driver passenger figure and this thing i saw it on somewhere it was like 199 and it had a chassis mounted servo i was like well you know for 199 if you change wheels and tires put a better servo in there like a 25 gram something like kilogram servo or something you know and even if you upgrade the motor like to a 550 or a Holmes Hobby motor, you would still have something decent probably. Could not find one for the $200 price anywhere that you could get it shipped to the United States. Everywhere I found it, you had to buy this thing for two or two fifteen on this site, and then they wanted to charge you $98 to ship it. And I'm like, two fifteen dollars and 98 makes it over $300. I'm not putting that kind of money in that one. I would lay my money in the Red Cat Gen 8 before I throw out 300 and something dollars of something 
coming, you know, just my opinion. I'm here listening, just fiddling with tackle at the desk. Hey, massive clouds. I feel you. That's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> Trying to get ready. Remember, I am budget guy RC. What all I got? Three alt hooks. A couple packs of that. I have my Gen 8 with me. Going to pull the 45 Tekken out for a different truck. Oh. Called a 5.6 large mouth bass today. Oh, a, a Ned Rig. Yeah, the Ned Rig. I got me some bullet weights. Those are 316. And these are 1 8 ounce. What do you think of the new Mini Z 124? I think it looks awesome. Probably one of the best bodies on an RTR out there. I mean, it just looks really scale. And if it performs half as good as what I've seen, it's going to be a great RC. 316th is your favorite? Well, I got a pack of the 316th. There's 10 of them, the bullet ones. Like I said, I got the hook. Got some one eights. So if I want to, you know, throw something a little heavy. Then I didn't have this color, and I've been hearing everybody say that lipless crankbait is killing it in this color. That crawdad kind of red orange. Everybody said they were killing it with lip lipless crankbaits in this color in dirty water. So, say Car Carson's got some too. And then Strike King, one eighth ounce jig heads. Yeah, that's what people say that them lipless cranks with that uh, crawfish colors. Is the juice that's what people have been telling me, and then I got these small zooms. I'm gonna rig some, I'm gonna rig one of them up with one of these one eight ounce jig heads. I'm gonna put one of these as a trailer, and it's got the paddle tail, got the paddle tails on them. I'm going to put one of these. I've got a chatterbait. And I didn't have any. It's a white chatterbait, I think. And I didn't have any white trailers. So, I think I'm going to put that as a white trailer behind my white chatterbait. Well, like I said, I've got a chatter that I haven't used yet. I was waiting until I could get something to put on the back of it as a trailer that kind of matched the color of the skirt. And that's what these are for. And then some trialing 12 pound smooth cast extra, smooth cast super strong is what it's supposed to be. I went with 12 pound. I do mostly spinning reels. Well, wait a minute. In the last five or ten years, it's all spinning reels. I haven't fished with anything else in the last five to ten years. 
and that uh massive clouds that uh 12 pound is for the Abel Garcia Silver Max is what it's for. Yeah, I've got a, uh, I got a six six, yeah, a six six rod outside on the back porch, and the reel that's on it was giving me some trouble the last time I had used it. It was just a, one of those uh, like fifteen twenty dollar reels, and it was it started giving me some trouble, and but it's on an Abel Garcia six foot six rod. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the Silver Max, I'm going to put that 12-pound line on the Silver Max, and then I'm going to put the Silver Max on that 6.6 rod and take that other reel off and just put it up as an emergency one, you know. Ah, oh, say so I love it. I hope I do, man. But, yeah, that's what I got. I got a... Uh, Take that other reel off that rod. Yeah, I think it is. The five to one. Hold on. Yeah, 5.1 to one. Yeah. Six ball bearings. I got the, uh, I didn't get the smaller size. I got the, uh, the 40. They had the 30 and they had the 40 hanging there. They had a 30 and a 40 and I went with the 40. Because the 30, you could only go up to 8 or 10 pound line on the 30. The 30 could only go with 8 or 10 pound line. I think it was 8 or 10. I forgot what it was. This one can go 10, 12, up to 14. Yeah. If, I, if I'm going to use this as my main bass setup, I wanted to be able to put it 12 pound on it to start. And if I get broke off a decent amount, because then I can go back and go to the 14. You know, because that's the highest you can put on the reel. But I can go to that. Whereas my other bass rod is just for my, you know, for trying to throw out there, just catch something smaller. I only run about six or eight pound test on it. That's my uh lose Hank Parker combo I've got in the living room. It's the spinning reel with the uh the lose spinning reel with the lose Hank Parker edition. I think it's a six foot medium action rod. I've got like six or eight pound on that. That's just for throwing my lighter bass plugs and smaller bass plugs. Try to catch the smaller bass. But I wanted something that I could throw the bigger plugs on. You know. I got the lose hypersonic. That's like the Hank Parker. Cool. Yeah, I've got the white Hank Parker reel. The white rod, I think it is. You run eight pound mono on it. I think I'm running six or eight on that one that I've got. But. This one here, like I said, this Silver Max, I'm going to put 12 on it to start out with and see how it does. But I may end up going up to the 14, even maxing it out down the road. Or even just putting like a 15-pound, taking the 12 off and putting a 15-pound braid on there. It should handle that no problem. You know, later time, if I don't like this 12 pounds, you know. But if you ain't catching nothing but two and three pound fish, I'm, very rarely are you going to break 12 pound line catching a two to three pound fish, you know. Caught three over five pounds on that line. Yeah, see, to me, this is the way I do it. I have one bass rod I like to run six or eight on. And I'm planning on throwing out the smaller lures 
bass lures, maybe some crappy little bigger crappy lures on that. And if I get a bass on it, I'm figuring he's going to be anywhere from a pound to three and a half or four. Well, I'm going to go do a video later, guys. All right, Bull Gear RC videos. Appreciate you stopping in, man. I'll keep an eye out for that uh, power wagon video when you do it. And congrats on the Forerunner, the Mini Z, the Kyosho. Congrats on that. Even though it hasn't arrived yet, you've already got one coming. Congrats. But yeah, that, that's the way I do it, Master Clouds. I'll sit there and I'll put like six or eight pounds on one of my bass reels and rods. And then I'll take another setup and I'll run 10, 12, or 14 on it. Yeah, if you set your drag, you can land 12 pound, 12 pound fish on a six. Yeah, I mean, I've seen people throw out with 10 pound line and catch a 10, 12 pound cat fish, you know. Everybody thinks you got to put 20, 30, 40, 50 on there just to land one. All depends about the technique. A lot of times you can land them on. You think about it. You buy a brand new Zebco 33 from the store. Combo. With the, the closed face little 33. Mash the button. You get out there and you throw it. That thing might come with 6, 8, or 10 on it. Strand, possibly. You throw that out. And you've seen people catch five, six, seven pound bass on them things. I've seen a YouTuber using 17 pound, catch a 52 pound blue cat. See? Now what I want to do is if this is if this 12 doesn't work on the on the silver max, I may just go get me some like 15 pound braid. You know, something like that, and maybe up it to that. If you know, if I if I say, well, going from twelve pound, you know, mono to fourteen mono ain't gonna be that big of a difference. Let me go up to at least from twelve up to the fifteen braid, and see how that does. Yeah, and also it's supposed to help cut out. You're not supposed to get as many line twists with this style. It's that uh, smooth cast. Supposed to make it cast smoother so you don't get as many line twists as you do with regular conventional line. That's why I buy trialing when I buy you know mono. When I buy mono, generally I try to buy trialing because I can get the one that's smooth cast, and you don't get as much. You still get some here and there, but you don't get near as many line twists. When I bought my Hank Parker Lou setup. It was a combo. Came already pre-spooled with line on it. It was like every time I threw out, I was getting line twists. It was trying to come off in clumps, trying to knot up. And you could tell that it looked like the line was even all the way around the reel, but it just wanted to give me fits. So I pulled the 10 they had on it all, or 8, whatever they had on it. And then I put something by trilene on there. And it Every now and then I'll get some twists in the line, but it's nowhere like it was. So, can't really complain now compared to what it was. It was like every other time I threw it when I first bought it. Now, it's once in a blue moon. What I hate is when you throw out and you go to start reeling, and you don't real you don't realize it until you done reeled in, and then you look, and part of your line's done come up off the spool, went back here, and wrapped around behind the spool, and you got to sit there and pull all that back off to get it out from wrapping around, and start back over. Yeah. It's not fun, is it? <laughs> now, that's one reason I'm still apprehensive about trying any kind of bait caster. My biggest thing is you can bird nest on any, or backlash on any given day. Even people that have been fishing them for two, three, four, five years or more still get them. 
They they say it. They do it on YouTube, and they say they still get them. My thing is, you out there, and you got something that runs deep. You know, like a, with treble hooks on it. We're not talking weedless. You got treble hooks on it. You chunk it out there. You side on it, whatever you do, and it burden ass backlash on you. And you got this bunch of like knotty looking thing, and you're sitting there trying to do all this so you can straighten it out and reel it in. That plug, more than likely, went to the bottom, found it some tree branches to land in, and as soon as you go to start doing this, you're hung. You done broke off your five, ten, fifteen, twenty dollar lure, possibly. Yeah, all pros burden this. It's like everybody that use uses a bait caster burden this sometime or another. That's just like if you use a spinning reel. You're gonna get some of that line twist inevitably, you know, depending on the class of reel. Of course, the better the reel, the less chance and the better the line, the less chance of it. But you're gonna get line twist here and there. You know. And the wraparound tip. That's the most aggravating because you think you clear and you go to swing out and it just or breaks off because it's wrapped around the tip and you just drop your plug in the water and you're looking up there seeing string and hang, hanging down from the front, the first eye. Yeah. They say anytime when you throw like this directly into the wind, unless you've got it set to just perfectly, the dials on it and the correct size lure set up when you do this it's going to cut down the distance by half that it's going to go and it's going to go all up out of the reel with the with the wacky birds and this you know situation but yeah I heard wind was really really bad on them now Nine times out of ten, when you throw in a spinning reel, which is, like I said, it's all I fish with. Oh, yeah, if the wind's in your face, it will slow your lure, causing your reel to outrun it. Yeah, because the wind's pushing your lure back as it's trying to fly out, and your reel's still churning that line out at 25 miles an hour, but your lure just slowed down to five. And you, and then you're sitting there for a half hour, trying to dig out the knots or whatever, all this bird's nest, before you can fish, hoping your lure ain't got hung up. My sinuses is acting up. You have to excuse me, trying to keep from sneezing. But, uh, you have to, uh, hope you don't break off something or get it hung up. Well, that's just like a lot of you rookies will tell you. On a windy day, they'll crank their brakes at least to around seven. A lot of people say they'll crank their brakes to at least seven. And then they'll crank the other side almost all the way to where it's barely coming down when it's real windy. So that way it's going slower. Or they try to fish where they ain't got to throw, you know, facing the wind. But I've seen a lot of the guys that really – Fish a lot, set that bait caster down because the wind was blowing so hard and bring out the old spinning rod. Now, the spinning rod, the biggest thing is the loss of distance. I mean, come on. Spinning rod doesn't generally throw as far as a bait caster anyway. And you throw into a 12, 15 mile an hour wind with a spinning rod. It's generally, you're going to think you're aiming it 50 yards to 75 yards out, and it's only going to probably go 25. Because I've ran back and just slung some stuff that normally would go 50, 75. I mean, just get out there. But that wind be blowing about 15 mile an hour, and it'd go like half the distance and either drop here or half the distance and go off to the left. And you just did this. Went straight forward. But for some reason or another, that wind was coming in at an angle. It took it 20 feet over here to your left that you didn't want to go to. I've had that happen where throwing straight into a clearing, the wind blow it left and landed in a tree.
Yeah, of course, if you're throwing heavier, a heavier lure, it's going to pull that line off that spinning reel and try to cut through that wind a little bit better. Yeah, on a bait caster. To me, this is just my opinion because I don't know much about bait casters. <clears throat> but I know side arming them, like flipping that wrist and doing this and throwing them out is a lot easier than this. You know, if you don't want bird nests. I had got a used one off a guy one time. Crank the brakes up on it a little bit over here. Crank the dial on it a little bit over here. <clears throat> mash the button. Excuse me. Mash the button. Wash the lure slowly fall. Threw it out. Didn't like the distance it had. It only threw like 10, 15 feet. And I was like, so I loosened some of the stuff up just a little bit more. Slung it outside on it again. Got a little bit further. I loosened them up till I could get at least as far as my spinning reel. Then I loosened it up a little bit more. And I swung it, and I'm sitting there going, wow. It went at least 10, 20, 30 yards further than what I was throwing the spinning. But then I made that fatal mistake. I was doing good this way. No backlash. And then I ran back and did this. And it was a plug that dives, treble hooks on it, the three, three here and three back here. Lost that booger because it went down to the bottom. And when I was trying to dig out the bird nest, hung it up and broke it. Well, that's like, if I'm throwing crappy jigs, if I'm throwing crappy jigs, yeah, I ended up giving that rod and reel away. It pissed me off so bad when I started losing stuff like that every time I'd overhand it. I could get the brakes. I could get everything dialed in. I could side arm it, swing it way way out there in the lake, swing it way out there. I mean, just dominate compared to the spinning rail. But every time I'd overhand it, I couldn't get it set up where it would throw that distance without bird nesting. And <clears throat> I got tired of losing lures. <clears throat> and I'm like, <clears throat> excuse me. I was like, all right. I might as well go back to spinning. This one was given to me, or it was either in a trade or it was given to me by a guy. It was old and used, you know, so I didn't really have a lot in it, so I just gave it away to another guy that wanted one. I'm like, well, there you go. You can have this one. I think it was a... It was a black bait caster. I don't know the name of it. And it was on like a 7.3 rod. I think it's what it was. I want, to, I want to say it was a 7.3 or a 7.5 rod. So, you know, it had some of the right ingredients, but now, like I said, I got that 6.5 foot rod outside and I'm going to put that Silver Max on it. And that's going to be my main combo for the bigger bass. That's what I'm going to plan on using for them. My Hank Parker is going to be towards just throwing out the smaller lures, trying to hopefully catch the smaller fish, you know, smaller bass. Now, I've got one in there I mainly run, throw crappy jigs on. I'm only running like, it's either two or four pound test on it for that reason. Because I don't plan on catching anything but some brim, some crappy, maybe a few small mouth bass that hit the crappy jigs, you know, a couple pounds at the most. So I'm either running two pound or four pound on it because it's a small reel. It's one of the small mini reels, but like this. And uh, I didn't like the rod. I, the rod that came with it broke. I picked up another rod and I made the mistake. I didn't measure the reel, how far it was like this before I bought the rod. And when I put my reel in there and screwed it all the way down, it didn't cinch up real tight. And you can do this, wiggle the reel a little bit, and almost pop it out of there. And I didn't want to put a zip tie around it and have that aggravate my hand and fingers. So I got me a six-foot rod to put that reel on. And it's a six-foot medium action. And I'm going to use that for my crappy 
from a crappy rig, using all my fake stuff that I throw out for crappy and brim. It's going to be on that. I always catch my biggest fish on, on my finesse spinning. Yeah. That's a lot of times how it works. You go out there and you got this one right here on six pound line and you're throwing out small lures. You got this one over here with 12, 14, 17, 20. You're throwing out. Nothing's hitting this one. And you're getting six pound fish hooked on this one. It, it, I used to go out every time I'd go catfishing. Wow, you lost nine. How many did you catch? You lost nine. How many did you catch? Wow, kept straightening the hooks out. Now, that's probably going to happen to me. Because remember, like I said, budget guy. I use cheaper stuff. I might, I, yeah, I might have some Eagle Claw stuff in there, but then, and which is pretty good, but then some of my stuff is going to be No Name, Ozark Trail, Walmart brand, or the no name brand that a lot of stores sell, you know. We, like what you saw in the bag tonight, those trailers or Zoom. Yeah, I run Zoom stuff. The jig heads, I've never had any Strike King jig heads before that pack, that three pack, the one eight ounce. Never had any, you know, Strike King. Jig heads like that. But the three alt hooks that I bought, they're just no name. I think it's Ozark Trail from Walmart. But you get five hooks in a pack. And I'm like, if they straighten them out and I lose a the fish, then okay, it'll be lesson learned. If I can't catch stuff with them and I'm losing too many fish because they're cheap and weak, then I know I got to upgrade and step up a level in hooks. But when you're on a budget and you see a chance to get five hooks for a dollar or ten hooks for two dollars, you give it a try and hope it at least lands you some fish to make it worth, you know. Well, you remember them uh, little lures I showed you, them little rubber bodies that were about this long. They were kind of a... Uh, uh, I want to say a brown color. Had a big fat head on them. They were about that long. And they were just a rubber body. Part of me was going to take one of them and hook it on that chatterbait. And use that as the trailer on that chatterbait. But I got, yeah, new penny. Yeah. I got to thinking about that color. And I heard all these guys talking about they generally try to match up the trailers to whatever the buzz bait the chatterbait or spinnerbait has. If you're running a white one and, it, and it's white, got a white skirt, then you run a white trailer. If you're running a white one with a chartreuse skirt, then you run a chartreuse trailer or something like that. Well, I'm sitting here going, that's a penny color. Being pulled behind a white chatterbait might not go over well. So that's the reason for those white zooms, the flukes, the little mini flukes. Yeah, match the hatch. What I plan on doing is taking those little mini ones, the little new pennies. I'm going to take the new penny ones, and I'm just going to take one of those 1-8 jig heads, and I'm going to put me one on there like that and just cast it out like that and see if it can get me some bites. And then maybe run it as a trailer for a darker color, you know. Like say if you got a brown and blue, you know, brown or a black one that you're throwing out, maybe put it with something like that down the road. But keep the whites for the lighter colors. But yeah, thing is. And this doesn't, some, some reason or another, it doesn't work as good in a kayak because you're sitting down 
in the kayak, you know, even if you're on top of the kayak, you're still sitting down on the water and throwing out and having to try to set the hook while you're sitting down. I'd run it on a PB and J jig. I saw one of them today and almost bought it. But I, I had other stuff that I knew I needed more right now that I grabbed instead. But uh, I may I may do that. I may get me a PB and J jig and then put that trailer on it down the road. Now, from the kayak, you know, you're sitting down. You don't have as quite as good a you know, hook setting ability because you're sitting, of course, as you would if you were standing up and you were able to, you know, really go into it. When you're sitting down, you, you know, have quite as good a, you know, hook setting ability. Well, my thing is, I always bank fished or pier fished. And so when I ran, let's just say brim, fishing for brim, sunfish, crappy, I always ran like five foot just little five foot rods with a spinning reel on it. Oh, probably one of the micros, you know, about like that. I'd run anywhere from two to four pound line on that little rod. So I could cast the stuff out. But I've noticed in the boat when I got my kayak, I noticed I would throw that little five foot rod out. And I was getting a lot more of the wrapping around of the tip of the rod with that little short rod. And plus, when I was throwing out, I'd throw out towards the bank over here. And I'd wait on something. And I'd wait on a strike. And when the court would start to go under, I'd go to set the hook. And the five-foot one just wasn't giving me the hook set from that sitting position. As opposed to when I'm standing up on a pier and one down here in the water hits it. And I can just snatch up and get them. So... I'm going to do away with the five foot rod and go to a six. So that way it gives me an extra foot, you know, when it comes to hook sets on the brim rod, when I'm fishing for brim. Same thing with my crappy setup. Yeah. Not enough backbone in the rod for setting the hook because you're looking at a rod and one of them is collapsible, starts out about this big and goes out to about five foot. But when I go to snatch one from the boat because I'm sitting down and it don't have much of a backbone, I do this and I pull the cork right up back up on top of the water and nine times out of ten they get away. For every fish I catch with that setup, I'm losing at least one if not more. For every one I catch, I lose one, two, or three. So I want to up it from a five foot to a six foot. I think it's medium, but I'll have to check it. Give me a minute and just a second, and I'll go over there and check it. But uh, I want to take the brim one, which, like I said, is a little micro reel. I want to take it and go from five foot to six foot. And then I want to take the one that I throw crappy jigs on, and I want to take it from five to six foot. Well, that way, sitting down in that kayak, I've at least got a six footer. All right, give me a second. I'm going to walk over there and check that and see. But I think it's medium action on the Hank Parker. The white combo, like I told you, you're only supposed to go with 10 pound line. I'm running six or eight. And it is medium action. And for this rod, you're only supposed to use four to eight pound line. This rod says four to eight pound line. So, but that's a medium action. 
And that's what I use for my, uh, here it is. That's what I use when I'm throwing lighter lures, like this top water plug, stuff like that. I think I've got six on this. Now, this is my micro that I use for brim. That's what I use for my brim. And as you can see, these slide together. This whole thing breaks down. It's only five foot, I think. Actually, this brim rod, it's this thing right here, it's four foot six, is what it says. I think they made a mistake because it's a little bit closer to five foot. It might not be five, but I think it's a little closer to five than it is four six. Yeah, it's telescopic. It closes all the way down to where it's only about yay big. When I had a bigger tackle box, I used to keep this in the bottom of the tackle box at the front of the tackle box and then put my tackle trays back behind it. And then when I go out to go fishing, if I was fishing brim, I could just unzip the top, reach down, grab this out, just bring it out and start throwing. I've used this one. I've probably had this thing for 10 years. It's a Shakespeare rod. And a Shakespeare reel. And I've had it at least 10 years. But if this ain't this ain't even five foot. And like I said, when you're fishing down in that kayak, you ain't got no hook setting power because you're already sitting. Plus, this thing's not even five foot long. So this blue and black reel is gonna go on a six foot rod. That way I get a little bit better hook setting power. Now this one, this is a this is a Shakespeare reel. This is my crappy one, but this the style rod it is. This doesn't screw in far enough, and the reel. If you sit, listen, that's it trying to come out of there. So if I got a real big fish and he yanked back on it, it might could just break it right out of there. Because it's so loosely fitting up in there. This is a Durango rod. Ultralight. Ultralight five foot. So this is only five foot from a crappy. The other one's only four and a half foot. They're fine when you're fishing from a pier. And you're throwing out like this and you're up high. And you just bring back and set the hook. You know, I do good at catching brim from the pier. But I lose as many as I catch when I'm sitting in that kayak because I can't get the hook set with these short rods. So I'm going six foot with the brim one and with this crappy one here. So that way I can get a better hook set when I'm sitting in the kayak. This is what I'm going to. Six foot. This thing screws way in. All this comes into here. Where it's only about that wide which will hold anything. And then it's got your lure and your hook holder right here. It's a Shakespeare excursion. Six foot, medium action. It's set up for 
six to twelve pound line. So, but I think this will be a good brim rod. I think this will be a good crappy rod. Yeah, both those two reels I just showed you are going on this style rod. The little mini, mini, mini telescopic is going here. That way I go from four six. I'll be going from four foot six up to six foot. I should be able to sit in the kayak and get a lot better hook set. And then that five foot one, the reel, the Shakespeare reel that's on it, is going to be on one of these as well. That way I got at least a six foot rod to get a hook set on because I'm in the kayak. To me, the, the four and a half foot and the five foot is fine for pier fishing or bank fishing because nine times out of ten, you're standing up and you're higher up than them. And you get the leverage. But now with this, I can be sitting down. And because of that longer rod, I can still get that leverage. Yeah. A lot of times it's got a... Yeah, it looked pretty good. I can't complain. And I like this type of real system. When it's these. Because see all that. You got all that left to thread it in. So I can bring that thing all the way in to where it's sitting way up in here. So a little reel fit on it. Ah, wishing I was fishing with my grandkids. I know why you love it. Wishing I was fishing. That part of it. I know that's why you love it. But yeah, bro. We were talking about different rods. We were talking about getting leverage on fish. And getting leverage when you're sitting in the kayak. Well, sitting in a kayak or sitting on a kayak. If you're using a little four and a half foot rod. If you're using a little four and a half foot rod or a little five foot rod, it's hard to get the leverage to get that hook set when you're sitting down on the kayak, as opposed to standing up on a pier and you're coming up like this from the water, setting the hook on. My little four and a half foot telescopic worked fine on a pier when I was bank fishing or up, you know, and stuff like that because I was standing up. But now that I'm sitting down in that kayak. That little four and a half foot rod just ain't wanting to give me no hook set. For every brim I catch out at the lake when I'm in the kayak, I lose two or three. You know? So I decided to get off the little four and a half foot for the little mini and go up to six. And then I took my crappy rod from a five foot up to a six. So that way, you know, I'm going to be out there with six foot equipment or six and a half, whatever. One of my bass rods will be six and a half it's on the back porch. My other bass rod will be a six footer. And then I'll have the two six foot ones right here. Yeah, well, they're sitting down in the kayak. I just can't seem to get enough leverage on the hook sets. When I was out there fishing out of that kayak, I probably had bites from like 20 different brim and only caught three or four of them in the kayak. You know. And I'm sitting there going, when I when I had these hits, they actually took the cork underwater to run with it. And I'm sitting there going, if I'd have been standing on a pier on a bank, I'd have, I'd have had that one. I started seeing it that way. You know, and one of them's an ultra, ultra light rod. So it's real bendy. That not as easy for hook, hook setting it. But I mean, not sitting down in a boat. So, but yeah, I've got a, I don't think I have any nine foot rods anymore. You got my 10 foot that I had. You ended up with it. That 10 foot Daiwa. I think it was a Daiwa Eliminator. You got that 10 foot Daiwa Eliminator from me. And then you got the Daiwa Regal. Regal Reel.
Well, in case you didn't see it earlier, wishing I was fishing, brother. In case you didn't see it earlier. Well, 10 foot rods are better for striker, in my opinion. That's all I used the 10 foot rod for when I had it. I just got the 3 foot 6 pin rod, loaded it with 2 pound line, going to take it cart fishing. Good luck. Good luck on that one. But I didn't know if you were in here when I showed off. One eighth ounce. Yeah, that's what, uh, Massive Cloud said. He said that's a nice one. I didn't have that color. And everybody was talking about how good that color was. I'm putting one of these behind a uh, chatterbait I've got. I think it's white or white and chartreuse. And I'm going to put that behind it. And I'm going to take one of them and just rig it up on this jig head and run it by itself. And then Ten, ten, uh, three sixteenth ounce bullet weights. Twelve one eighth ounce ones, and then three out hook. Because I realized I didn't have a. Yeah, that's what a lot of a lot of people said. They've been hitting in the muddy water. They've been hitting with the rattle traps or lipless crankbaits and stuff like that. They've been wearing them out. And I'm like, well, everybody's talking about they've been wearing them out with that. And I've seen the majority of people that have been wearing them out have been using that red or crawfish color. But. And the reason for the bullet weights is that's just all I've ever used when I did. Like when I throw a rubber worm, it's going to have a bullet weight above it. That's the way I've always rigged it up. You got like a weedless hook here with the rubber worm on it generally. Generally. And then you had the bullet weight above it. You know. Now, the two alt hook. Run the, run the head on there. Pop it through. Come around, hook it up, then hook the hook through part of the body and barely had the tip showing through with the bullet above that. You know. But I've got some weedless hooks that I've had for years. And they're already they're already rigged up on some worms. Yeah. Because if you can if you can fish something that can be pretty weedless and pretty resistant to getting hung up. And still produce fish on it. To me, that's the better way to go. 
That's the only thing I hate about the three prong hooks. If it does anything under the top of the water, goes down any further than three feet, you got to start worrying. Because it's getting hung up on a tree branch or something under there, a log. Next thing you know, you're breaking off. <clears throat> Even if you paddle over to it and try to unhook it, a lot of times you'll end up breaking off. I saw a guy on one video I was watching the other day. He, he paddled. He had the pedals on his, the foot pedals. He pedaled all the way over to the lure and was trying to bring it up out of there. It snapped, snapped his line as he was trying to get unhung. So it's not, a, it's not a given just because you can take your kayak and get over there where it's at that you're going to get it back. Because, you know, them three-prong hooks, if you've got two of those three-prong hooks, they get hung up pretty bad. I run all my crank baits on the bottom. I, I kind of like top water, top water plugs because, you know, you don't have to worry about hanging them much. I like I like the uh, ones that dive, but only to like three feet or six feet. The ones that are generally a three foot to six foot dive, and that's about all they go. Because if you're out in the middle of the lake throwing them, and you're reeling in, at, you know, doing them right, you're generally not hanging them up. Somebody gave me some of those. The helicopter lure kit. Somebody gave me some of those. Maybe it was the spot I was fishing. Maybe it's the way I was fishing it. But I never had any luck. I think I've still got one helicopter lure left. One of the green helicopter lures. Kind of a neon green looking color. I think I got one left. Yeah, helicopter lure kit. Uh, it was a rubber body. And down at the bottom of it, where most rubber bodies would just have a paddle tail or a squiggly tail, one tail. It has like three like curves coming off around it to make it look like a helicopter. And when you're reeling it, it's supposed to it look, make like a helicopter action in the water. And it's, look, bass are supposed to be able to just not resist it. They've got to eat it. They've got to attack it. Of course, when they were trying to sell it, every video showed them catching countless ones. Yeah. It's probably antique stuff now. That was stuff I used more than 10 years ago. But that was like one company came out with a kit of like rubber minnows, banjo minnows. They came out either right before the helicopter lure or right after it. It was called the Banjo Minnow, and it had some weird rig up you had to do with it, but it was supposed to triple your bass catching with this kit. Trust me. They said it didn't matter whether you were fishing from the bank, fishing from a boat. So you remember the Banjo Minnows. Well, the helicopter lure was kind of named, kind of the same gimmick, supposed to just really take your bass fishing to the next level. <clears throat> you know, put you on the top of the game. <laughs> it did not work. Not like that. Now, I'm not saying I didn't never get a hit on one. Wishing I was fishing 73. Yes, like rubber buzz bait. But I had no luck with the banjo minnows. I took the bodies because I didn't like the weird rigging system that came with them. I ended up taking the banjo minnow bodies and running jig heads through them and just making them like a weedless lure and got more bites out of them that way. But the uh, helicopter lures, I never, ha I never had any. I never caught a fish with the helicopter lures. Of course, I might have been fishing it wrong. Too fast of a retrieve, too slow of a retrieve. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I know I didn't catch anything with the helicopter lures. 
Luckily, I didn't have much money invested in them. Cool. I know the banjo, you ended up, I think it was, what was it, two or three different sizes that they came in? You could get the smaller ones, look like you could actually catch some crappie with them. And then you could get a medium, and then you get the large. And then what was it, four? Was it four or five different colors that they came in? But yeah, I fished them. I didn't do a whole lot. Like I said, I got a few bites on the banjos. Never really caught nothing on them. But I don't remember ever even getting a hit on the helicopter lure. <clears throat> but I mean, let's be honest. This part that I showed y'all where I went down there and showed y'all where I was going to be fishing off that bank and where I'd like to put my kayak in and start fishing in that cove. I fished from that bank two to two or three different times now. I just ordered a new banjo minnows kit. I'm gonna shoot a video with them. Cool. I'll be looking for it. Maybe you can show me what I was doing wrong. Maybe I didn't hold my mouth right or something. I don't know. I never caught anything on them. I did get a couple bites here and there. I always got bites on the uh the medium and the small one. I never got any bites on the biggest one. But when, but when I took y'all down here and showed you that spot at the lake, I've been down there two or three times, once with live bait and didn't even get a bite. And I've thrown plugs down there and didn't even get a bite. So I'm going to probably try one or two more times with live and with fake stuff. And if I don't get any bites from the bank, then I'm going to keep that spot for when I get me a set of wheels to put up under the back of my kayak strap them wheels on grab the front rope put my fishing gear in it walk it down there get in that thing and go out in the cove and try to fish the cove from the kayak and see what i can do then i caught a few small ones but i had other lures that i knew caught fish so i didn't use the banjo minnow a whole lot well, that's like I watched a guy the other night. He was using a crankbait. And he said he never uses crankbait. He started wearing them out and he's going, he's looking at himself going, why don't I ever use these? Look what I just did with this. And he told everybody, he's like, after this video, I'm going to start using these more often. I mean, and he just didn't know why he'd never really used one. It was just one of the baits he said he'd never really thought about tying on and trying. Last time I used him, caught over 40 smallmouth bass. Wow. Last time I caught close to 40 fish was uh, fishing at a uh, dam. Using live minnows and shiners. I ended up catching, I think it was 26 small stripers. I had like three or four of them big enough to keep. The rest of them were right there near it, but not. Needless to say, I had me some good fillets. Yeah, well, this this Spillway River was had been there whew, ever since my dad went fishing. So he told me I would at least give it a try. And a buddy of mine liked fishing down there. So me and him went down there. And we fished one area of it. And I saw another spot coming away from the dam where the water comes down. And you go to go around a curve, and there was a couple rocks that stuck like halfway out into the river. And they were big enough that you could get up on them and fish from them. So I literally walked out on these two big rocks, set my tackle over here on this one rock. I sat on the other, stood on the other rock, and I would chunk all the way out in the middle, let it catch it, 
and start taking it. And as soon as it would take it from the fast water into the slow, right as it would hit the slow water, you'd see that cork go under and you'd be setting the hook and you'd be reeling one in. Like I said, I probably it was either 21 or 26 or something like that. <clears throat> and they had to be like 21 inches to keep them while I was fishing that. And I think I had somewhere between three and five that were 21. And I ain't gonna lie, I did sneak a couple of 19s and 20s out. I put the 21s on top of a one or two 19 and 20s. And walked them out that way. Just in case. So that way I could go home and do up a big filet dinner for the whole family. I went home and filleted them. We cooked them in the oven. Only thing was my girlfriend was pregnant at the time. And she didn't get to eat any of them. And man, it was some of the best fish I ever ate. And I fixed them. Like I said, I took the striper, I filleted them, I took them, I laid them in a pan with aluminum foil lying in the bottom of the pan. When I laid the fillets in there, I took me and put me a little bit of water in there, and then I poured me a little bit of lemon juice in there, just a tad, and then I put me some lemon pepper seasoning in with it, and then I folded the aluminum foil over the top of the fish, and then put them in there on broil. Oh, man, some of the best eating I'd ever had. And I was like, wait a minute. I went and caught these, fixed them, and cooked them, cleaned them, cooked them, everything, and ate them. So, yeah, it was just perfect. I live 40 minutes from Kentucky Lake, so I'm hoping to fish it some this spring. I've got a lake 15 minutes from the house loaded with small bass, smallmouth bass. Cool. Well, see, back when I used to catch and cook them, my sister ate fish, I ate fish, my girlfriend ate fish, but she just happened to be pregnant at the time, and the smell of them made her nauseous, so she didn't want none of them. But it made her mad because she was nauseous because she loved fish. And she was like, man, I hate that I couldn't get none of those. Now, luckily for me, she was pregnant, and she was nauseous because a buddy of ours came over a week or two later with some trout that he had caught, and I'd never ate trout, and he gave me some of it, and I had it all to myself. You know, I got a lake 15 minutes from my house, but I never catch anything over a pound. I catch and release now because I just haven't had that inkling to cook none of them. I'm not saying I won't go back to it. I used to love catching catfish and cooking them. Filet me up some catfish. My wife loves fish. I'm going to be doing a lot of catch and cook videos. Too many people pulling the bass out of the lake. Well, you know me, if I catch a bass, the only way I'm keeping him is if he's filet size. If I keep it. And that's not saying I'm keeping him. The only way I'm keeping a bass is if he's at least filet size and I can have some meat off of him to eat. But most of the time, I'm going to catch and release most of the time. Now, Brim, if I catch some slabs, you know, like my hand size or bigger, I come home and have me a fish fry, you know, for two or three people if I catch the right amount. Now, if I only catch two or three, I'm going to turn around and just release them. But if I sit down there and catch 15, 20 brim and they're like hand size, oh, I'm having me some food. But now crappy, oh man, I love to catch some crappy. Go out there with some minnows, catch some pound crappy. Well, I haven't, I haven't caught that many five pound bass so it's not like I catch and cook too many bass the only bass I've ever caught that I've ate a lot of is striper 
And it's nothing to catch a five-pound striper if you go to a dam. It's nothing to catch a five-pound striper and higher. That's why everybody uses those 10-foot rods. You go down to a dam and you're fishing for striper, everybody's got 10-foot, 12-foot, 15-foot rods and throwing out with 20 and above line. They'll go get, they'll take, they'll get like 20 pounds of mono put on it, like a third of the way up, and then they'll fill it up the rest of the way with like a 30 to 50 pound braid and go fish for stripers. One of my favorite is crappy. Yeah, crappy, crappie, whatever, whichever way we want to say it. I love to eat them. Man, if you catch you some nice pound ones, fillet them boogers. Oh, some good eating. But I like catfish. If I catch them from like, say, three pounds, I love the real, I really love the, the two to five pound catfish. To me, they got the better flavor. A two pound to a five pound catfish, to me, has a better flavor than if you catch that 12, 15, 20 pounder. To me, I like those more as like catfish nuggets. Or more in some kind of like stew. Yeah. You know, well that's that's ignorance and people just being greedy. Well, I, well, I went and bought this stuff and I'm using it to fish. I'm, ke I'm keeping everything I catch. You know, they get out there and catch a 10-inch smallmouth bass and keep 12 of them and they catch one that's or two that's over 12, and they lay them across the top. And they walk out of there hoping they don't get caught. Hoping the game warden doesn't go through all of them. Like I said, I've, the stripers that I caught, the smallest I kept were like 19 inches. 21 was the limit. And I had like three to five 21 inch ones, and I kept just a couple of the 19 and 20 inch ones to have enough for the whole family. Oh, yeah. Because they walk down there and they catch you keeping something that's not the right size. And they don't, and you don't walk away from the water. And these fish are basically dead now. You can lose your rods, you can lose your reels and tackle, and get fined. <clears throat> and you know, if you just went down there with $200 worth of rod and reels or more, and $100, $200 worth of tackle, Losing four, six, eight hundred dollars just to eat some fish. Excuse me, I'll go to Long John Silver's. <laughs> you know, I'll go to Long John Silver's and get me some fish. Or go to Walmart and pick up some kind of fish and cook it. I just don't see losing all my fishing gear. Like I said, that day, the only reason I did it is because the game warden had done been and left. That day, I didn't think he was coming back. I caught all these fish, and I threw away the smallest ones. And when I measured them out, I had three to five that were 21 inches, and then I had a couple that were like, one was like 19, one was 20. And I'm like, well, that's only an inch or two off. I'm only keeping a couple. I put them under the bigger ones, and I walked on out the, out the place. I saw a couple guys last year caught over 100 crappy around four to six inches. Wow. Yeah. What is it? Crappie got to be, what is it? Crappie got to be 10. Ain't the crappie have to be 10 or above? Ain't that what it's supposed to be? I know bass, they got to be over 12 inches. I know bass has got to be 12 inches or bigger. For you to keep it, any kind of bass, you know, at least you know, small mouth or large mouth bass, it's got to be 12 or bigger. But doesn't the crappy don't they have to be 10 inches or longer to keep the crappy? I know striper, they got to be 21. Got to be 21 inches to keep a striper at most places. Nine inches there. I think it's 10 here. I think. 
got to be 10 inches to keep a crappy, 12 inches to keep a large mouth or small mouth bass, a striper, most of the places in South Carolina have to be 21 inches or bigger to keep them. Now, other places are weird about it. You can only keep three above 21 inches, but you can keep five or 10 anywhere from 12 to 21. But once they get to that 21, you can only keep three. That was a uh, Russell Dam. That's what I was told the rules were at Russell Dam. Was waiting on the dock when they pulled up. I think it was $1,200 in fines each. Ouch. Man, that had to hurt. Here in South Carolina, it's 8-inch on crappy. I could have swore it was 10-inch, man. But I'll have to go back and look. Because I, I could have swore it was 10 for the crappie or crappy. That was 12 for large enough to small amount of bass. And I thought, what was it? Some places have 6 or 8-inch on brim. <clears throat> Some places don't have any limit on the brim. You just catch them. Because there's so many of them. But when I went to Spillway, a place called Spillway, and this was in like 96 South Carolina, I went there and they had to be 21 inches to keep, keep any stripers. And if they were 21 and over, you could keep, I think it was 8 or 10. But then I went to Lake Russell I went to what they call Russell Dam, which is on the border of South Carolina and Georgia. And there, you can only keep three if they're over 21 inches. In other words, you catch a 25-inch, 30-inch, you can only keep three. But if you catch them 12 to 20 inches, <clears throat> you can keep 10. Yeah, man, what did you do to get fined $1,800? And, of course, getting fined that much, of course, you're going to remember. That's one of those things you don't really forget. Shooting from the roadway. Oh, taking wildlife at night using artificial lights. Yeah, that's frowned on. So, South Carolina is eight inches on crappy. Well, I haven't, caught, I haven't caught any crappy in the year I've been here. I'm in hopes to change that. Because I want to take my kayak one day. I want to take my kayak one day over there where I showed y'all in one of my videos, me fishing off of a pier when I was testing out that depth finder. You were drunk with your uncle and he talked you into it. Yeah, that was a bad move. But I want to go back to that pier that I fished off of that day. I want to go back over there, and there's a boat ramp over there. And I want to try to launch my kayak. And hopefully, if nobody's over there near that bridge. What's up? Pocket rides. Uh, I'm hoping to go over there to that bridge. Marshall, what do you think about RC cars before marriage? Just kidding, Marshall. You need at least two or three before you get married. So if the woman don't like you getting them, you at least already had some. Gun, mag light, binoculars, knife. They took all my sh Yeah, they frown on that. We had a guy here coming up update our internet and took it from the cable <clears throat> to uh, fiber optics. I'm over here laughing, damn. Yeah, if, if, you, if you've already got you some RCs before you get married, then she can't, apply, she can't really complain about you having them. <laughs> and you always want to get that before marriage. <laughs> You definitely want to get that before marriage. 
Because nine times out of ten, after you're married, that's going to dip. Told me if I wanted my stuff back, I could go to auction in Frankfort, Kentucky and buy it back. Wow. No, uh, that pier that I fished off of when I did that uh, depth finder review. Right over there to the left of it, there's a bridge that the boats come under. And I know that bridge has probably got crappy stacked up under it at certain times of the year. And I would love to go over there and throw up under there. Whether I even whether I go completely under the bridge or not, at least be able to get near the bridge, drop my anchor, and throw up under the bridge some and around that bridge and see if I can't catch a few. But now, doing that, I would probably take me some minnows, some crappy jigs, a couple of different things like that. But I don't know if I want to go completely under the bridge because them boats come flying under there and them bass boats, they'll come up under there and they'd be done hit me or flip me over even if my boat is neon green. You know, my yak might be neon green, but they, they'd still say, well, I didn't see you. Well, if you'd have come through slower, you would have. Yeah. And my luck, it'd be one of the times when I didn't tie something down or didn't put a bungee over it. Yep. And all my crap's in the water. All my crap six, seven, eight feet under or however deep it is in that spot. 74.5 with the 2200 KV Traxxas E-Revo. 1.0 road crusher belted wheels 6s congrats yeah see wishing i was fishing 73 that's what i'm talking about i love the wheelies this truggy pull i bet that is true every time i've gone like bridges train trussels now train trussels are gold For some reason or another you take a boat and put it right there at the train trussle or under it and get up in there and fish it, it seems to be better than a car bridge. I don't know if it's the gravel that's up there. Some of it falls through up there around the train track beams and stuff. Some of that gravel falls through. It falls into the water and gives them more of a place to you know bed and stuff. But, man, a buddy of mine, we used to go fishing. And we'd fish under a train trussle. We'd walk the train tracks, go down the hill beside them, and sit under the train trussle. And there was a little bitty place where we could sit on some rocks. And we'd throw out and fish for crappy. I never fish for crappy, but my kiddo loves it. I always have bass lures tied on. You're like a buddy of mine I used to go fishing with. We'd go out there for catfishing. He'd come out with a rooster tail for bass. Yeah, train trussle. You know, going over a lake, you got the train trussle, and you got where it goes across. It's kind of like a bridge, but it's, yeah. They just, a lot of people call it a train trussle. It's where, it's where it's not solid, you know. It's going across the water, kind of like a bridge. And we'd go under that, and it's called a train tr trussle. That's what it was called where I was from. What's up, homie? But we'd go under there, and we'd <laughs> fish for crappy all the time and catch crappy. Well, good. At least somebody else has heard of a train trussle <laughs> besides just me. But, yeah. We go under there and fish minnows for crappy left and right. The only thing is, you're sitting under there when that train comes over. Oh, my Lord. You've either got to come out from under there when you hear him coming, or you better cover your ears real in and just cover your ears. Because it's definitely not fun being under there when he goes over. Normally, we would really, really in our stuff, lay it down, on the rocks, and we'd come out from under there, let the train go over, and then we'd go back under, start back fishing. 
It's just like going under a, yeah, deafening. It's just like going under a bridge that cars go over. You go under that bridge with a boat, whether it be bass boat, John boat, and you're sitting there throwing around them pylons for crappy under them or for bass. Crappy especially stack up around them pylons to hold the bridge up. I'm still aiming for that 80. Well, hey, at least you're not that far from it, my friend. What you said, 74.5? You use live bait for crappy. It depends on if you want to or not. I use minnows, small and medium minnows, when I fish for crappy. And I use crappy jigs. That's mainly what I use when I fish for crappy. And you throw up around them pylons that hold the bridge up. See? Crappy love minnows. If you got minnows and they're lively and you hook them where they can swim and be lively, ooh, you're going to get nailed some. If there's crappy in the area, you're going to get hit. Of course, if there's some bass in the area, you're probably going to get some hits from some bass too. Because, I mean, you got that minnow doing all this under there. But especially if you can go up under a bridge. You can go up under a bridge and fish for crappy. I highly suggest it. Huh? So you used to go all the time with your dad when you was a teenager. Well, I went with my dad some when I was a kid, but I mainly went with my friends as a teenager. My dad, I, I learned most of my fishing once I started hanging out with my friends as a teenager started learning it then i learned more about it then than i did with my dad with my dad he gave me like the zebco 202 first then he gave me a 33 and then he gave me what they call a 700 a zebco 700 hoss or boss is what it was called big old monster reel for bass and that's all i fished with that was the three different reels i fished with with him and then when him and my mom split, I started fishing with my friends. And I would, I'd carry a Zepco 33 with me and use that. And I saw them using spinning reels. And one of them let me use one one day. And I was sold as soon as I started using it. Once I started using a spinning reel, I quit using close face altogether. My friends taught me most of what I know as well. Yeah. A lot of times your friends, man, just hanging out with them, going fishing with them. You can learn a lot. You can catch fish that maybe you wouldn't have never caught with your parents. Like when me and my dad went, we always went to a lake. We fished from his boat. Me and my friends went, we went to creeks. We went to rivers. And we went to lakes. Plus, we went to dams and fished. <clears throat> I did all that with my friends. With my dad, I just went to a lake. That's all he ever went to with me was lakes. He'd take me to a lake and we'd fish. He'd pull up into a cove or an area that he thought was good. And we'd fish around in there for a few hours. We'd go load the boat back up and we'd leave. But with my friends, we hit creeks. We hit rivers and we went to dams and stuff and fish and places like that. And we hit, you know, lakes. I used to fish for catfish, striper, cob. I think bass a couple times. I also went shark fishing. Never been shark fishing in my life. Now, I did striper, catfish, bass, brim, crappy. I fished for all of them. Yes. 
I've got a video on my channel of me running it down there on the lake. And I've got FPV view where the camera's sitting up on top of the boat. And you can see an area of the lake that I fish at. You can see it from the boat. Yeah. It's a Neptune 28. That's what it's called. It's like 28 inches long, so over two foot. I'm out there on, I got it out there on Lake Marion running it around up in this area that I've been fishing. Yeah, Neptune 28 is what the boat is. You can buy them at Harbor Freight brand new for like, I think 50 bucks is what they sold for. I bought mine used from somebody on uh, Craigslist for like 30, I think it was. The only thing I've ever done to it was broke a propeller. I, I hit something while I was out in the water on this last run before the run ended and broke one of my propellers. Luckily, I had another one. I had a replacement. <clears throat> now, if I have to if I break another one, I'm going to have to start sourcing where I can get some because these like propellers screw on. They don't slide on and then have an E-clip to hold them. They actually have threads inside them to screw on to the shafts. But it's just a cheap brush boat. But it does pretty good. I think it's got like three, two 370, two little 370 or 380 motors. But considering 30 bucks, I mean... It moves pretty good. And when you take off wide open, when you first take off, I figure, I want to say 15 to 20 is what I'm thinking. That's my guess. I'll have the nose. It'll have the nose go up. Yeah, when I first take off on a fresh battery, the nose will do that. You'll see it trying to lift out of the water and when you watch the video the camera's sitting on top of the boat the angle it's got is giving you down the front of the nose so you're seeing the water real good you're seeing beside it you're seeing the nose of it and you can hear the motors because i didn't have the camera in a waterproof case or anything camera's not waterproof without the case but this is an old camera and the battery's really weak in it it only lasts for about 15 to 30 minutes when I use it. So I figured I'd take a chance because I'm going to be buying another camera. I'd run it without the waterproof case so everybody could hear the boat. You know. But, yeah, I didn't run it with no case. I and mean, you can hear the motors kicking in the back. Oh, no, no. Uh, Nim. That's the actual battery that goes to it. Seven point two volt, eighteen hundred milliamp hours. Now, I'm thinking since this is a seven point two, I'm thinking this little battery. I'm wondering. All right, this is a little eighteen hundred milliamp hour. 7.2 nickel metal. Now you might, you know, nine times out of ten, if you don't run a lipo cutoff, you chance messing up your lipo. If you don't have a lipo alarm or if your ESC doesn't have lipo cutoff. I've been tempted. To just try that one. I've got an adapter. That'll let this hook up. To this to me a plug in the on the ESC. That's a 1500 7.4 volt. So it's a 7.2, 7.4. Not that much difference. You got 1800, 1500. Now this right here, if it works and doesn't burn anything up, would give it just a little bit more juice. <clears throat> that you know, 0.2 volts is still a little bit more. I could imagine this boat on two or three S with a brush motor. Yeah, I mean, 
if if I change the radio system, like the radio and receiver and the ESC, if I change the electronics and at least put an ESC that has, because this is the old AM FM style radio that does this and has the long antenna. If I changed it over to 2.4 gigahertz and put an ESC that had a lipo cutoff on it, <coughs> oh, I would run. I would run this in it. 3,000 milliamp hour, 30C. Two cell with a 30C burst. 3,000 milliamp hour, 30C burst, two cell. Like I said, I would run that in it if I had an ESC that can handle it. But I'd have to get a new ESC and get the 2.4 gigahertz and upgrade to that so I wouldn't have no problems. But I'd rather try this first just to see if it gives it a little bit more juice. Because this battery, if you look at the one that came with it, there's not much difference in diameter. This battery could strap right into the same slot, put the rubber band across it, and hold it in place. And instead of being 7.2 like this, it's 7.4. So just a little bit more, uh, not a lot, but a little bit more. You know, you might could get a couple more miles an hour just out of this one. And then if it did burn up the ESC or the motor, then that gives you an excuse to put at least a better ESC in radio. I would say 30 to 37 on 3S is possible. Well, you know, it's definitely, with them electric boats, it's definitely not hard to hit 25 or 30. You can take a brush motor with a good 2 or 3S and get 25 to 30 mile an hour out of one. I've seen people do it. It depends on the hull design and the shape of the way the boat is, you know. But I just wanted to try a little lithium ion just to see if since it's only a lithium ion, it's only 7.4 instead of 7.2. So it's not a it's not like you're going from a nickel metal all the way up to a three cell. You know. Yeah, point two more might not even mess with the boat. It might just give it a little bit like an extra mile or two per hour on the speed. It's going to have about the same runtime, 1,500 milliamp Lion versus an 1,800 milliamp nickel, nickel metal. So this little Lion is going to get you a little bit more runtime. Plus, it might get you a mile an hour or two faster in the boat. I was thinking of water skipping or paddling with one of my RC, one of my cars, but I don't know. I'm not allowed. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the videos, but me, <clears throat> if I dropped that kind of money in the X Max, I would be totally scared, crapless, that I'm going to get it out there in the water, not throttle it right, and it's going to be like in a lake where the water gets. 20 foot or more deep. Whoa. Mine's going to quit walking the water and go under the water. And then there I go. You know, that would be my look. That's just the kind of look I have. But I understand the reasoning. Because, yeah, it's cool. You see an RC walk on water. Now, you know they make that, uh, that other RC. Yeah. That's without extra wheels or anything else, without batteries, and you're talking that kind of money. And once you buy your batteries for it, and you buy some, like, say, paddle-style wheels or something, you're sitting at over, a, you're probably sitting at eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 in it, and if it goes blue, 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 you can't get it. What you need to do is get somebody to go fishing that day, have them out there in their boat. You go to run it. If it goes to go under, they can go try to retrieve it from their boat. That's the only way I would think about doing that with that kind of price tag RC. Now, you can buy that one. I forgot the name of it. It comes with paddle-style tires. 
and it's a, like a kind of like an HBX or one of those off name brands. And it's got paddle style tires that are made for the water. And I've seen it go across, you know, like shallow lakes. These guys would run it all the way across. But you had to get the speed up before you hit the water. Because if you hit it slow, like cruise coasting, and then tried to gun it, it just blah, 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 blah. These guys would hit it with some decent speed and just zzz, all the way across the lake. Yeah, if I could win one, yeah, I'd definitely beat the snot out of it, have fun with it, you know, jump some ramps, you know, bash it up, you know, you didn't pay nothing for it, oh well. But I don't think I would go run it at the lake. Yeah. I saw somebody take a, a, a slash yeah, and they converted it to a monster slash. I know what you're talking about. They took and put a different motor in it and everything. They took and put wheels kind of like what would be on an E-Revo. That size wheels somewhere like that between the, you know, like this. Like 2.2s or something like that. They put those on there. And they kept the slash body on it. And just went out there and bash it up and jump it. They were ramping it and everything. Yeah. And they did. They had they had big wheels on it. Oh, yeah. It, it, they called it their monster slash. <clears throat> they had the four-wheel drive version. They said it was really fun in the mud. Because of the big wheels. They hit the mud pits. And you just see the mud flying from is what they said. But yeah, man. I, I like them, but. Does this guy have a channel here on YouTube? Uh, I don't know where I saw that. To be honest, I've been on YouTube for over five years. And this may have been back when I first started. Because, you know, Tracks of Slash has been out forever. So, I was I think I was looking at short course trucks when I first got ready to get one. Which would have been five and a half, six years ago. And I was watching videos. And I saw where a guy converted one. You could probably just type it in. Tracks of, tracks of Slash. Monster Slash, or converting my tracks of Slash into a Monster Slash, and see what comes up. And you might be able to find one of those videos like I'm talking about. You might even find his. I don't know, but some of the guys that started back when I started my channel, some of them have left altogether. And some of them have deleted their channels. Some of them left their content up so people could continue watching it. But others shut their channel down, took everything off. 2.8 trenches. Well, the one I, one of the ones I saw had 2.2s. They were about that wide. I'm more of a speed guy, massive, but bashing seems super fun at this point in my hobby. Might as well have a beater car, even if I break a few parts on it. So you remember seeing a monster slash. So Massive Cloud has seen one. A lot of people run 2.2s on them. A lot of people do go with the 2.8s. That's your decision if you're going to make a monster slash. A main hobby has a video on it. Well, there you go, Gorilla Bear Tech. Check out A main hobby's monster slash. I bought a short course truck edition Castle Creations 3800 KV brushless combo from Hobby Town USA a few days ago. Cool.
like I said, when I have these chats, generally, you can find something and you can find out stuff when we're talking. If I can't tell you the answer, generally somebody else on here can. And Massive Clouds just put the link to it. I have two of the short course truck edition castle systems. Cool. I kind of wanted to get me one of the armors. Ran one of them in a crawler. Huh? I kind of wanted to get me an armor, you know, Armor short course truck, not the 6S, not the newest one. Proline Road Rage is cool. All right, guys. I'm going to get ready and get out of here. I'm out of drink. <laughs> I've been out for a while now. Got a little bit thirsty. I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and end this. Well, fellas, I got to hop off here. Yeah, I'm about to do the same thing. But I added a padlock to the top of it, Marshall. I couldn't even hit 47 or 50 without it flipping. True. Yeah, I had a drink. It's like being at a movie theater and running out of drink. It's never good. And, you know, when you're talking like I do, your throat starts getting a little scratchy when you ain't had nothing to drink. So, all right, man. See y'all next time. Hopefully next Tuesday. Between 8 and 8.30, somewhere around that time. Unless I'm sick, which I hope I'm not. Peace. See you guys.